Hello all, this is chapter three, cell structure and function. So we can go ahead and get started. The cellular level of organization. So the cell marks the boundary between non-living and the living and is both the structural and functional unit of an organism. Also, it is the smallest structure capable of performing all functions necessary for life. So this is really important. Uh, there are two different cell types. So there are prokaryotic cells that lack a membrane-bound nucleus, and there are eukaryotic cells that possess a membrane-bound nucleus. So the word cell entered biology roughly in the 17th century, and it was these cells were discovered by the use of microscopes. And Robert Hooke of confirmed earlier findings and coined the term cell. And there was a series of German naturalists or scientists that discovered that both plant and animal tissues were made of cells. And they proposed the idea that cells originate from other cells. So the cell theory states that all organisms are composed of one or more cells. And these are the basic living unit structure of the organisms. And only cells can come from other cells. So an example of this, can a rock produce a cell? No. Can a piece of metal produce a cell or a living organism? No. So cells can vary in size, but most are quite small. A frog's egg is about one millimeter, and that is one, that is one cell, and it's large enough to be seen by the naked eye. <clears throat> Excuse me, but most cells are smaller than one millimeter, and some are as small as one micrometer. So here are the different sizes of living things uh, from a virus, of, which is roughly between 10 and 100 nanometers, all the way up to a blue whale, which is between 10 meters and 100 meters in length. Cells being small is an advantage for multicellular organisms so that nutrients can enter the cell and waste such as CO2 and uric acid can exit the cell. <clears throat> Therefore, cell area, or sorry, surface area affects the ability to get materials in and out of the cell. A cell's increase in volume, the proportionate amount of surface area decreases. So uh, we can basically skip this slide. Just remember of, you know, when think of a cell as a cube, the larger it gets, uh, the surface area decreases. All right. Same as this here, of, you will not be tested on this, but just to give the example that the surface area decreases when the cell size increases. Very, very important, prokaryotic cells. Uh, these are the really primitive cells. So they lack a membrane bounded nucleus, the DNA, the chromosome just hang out in the cell and is one of the most abundant and diverse life forms. So these cells, consists of the domains bacteria and archaea. They're generally unicellular, but maybe single strings or clusters. And just remember, not all bacteria cause disease, some are beneficial. So this is a table here to compare the major structural features of archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotes. So you can look at the cell wall, uh, archaea has one with no, peptoglyc uh, no peptidoglycan. Uh, the bacteria have that sugar, and eukaryotes is hit or miss. They all have a plasma membrane. Uh, only eukaryotes have a defined nucleus, which contains the chromosomes. And for membrane bound organelles, this is only in eukaryotes as well. And they all have ribosomes, which is what make uh, proteins in the cells. So prokaryotic diversity. So prokaryotes are structurally simple, metabolically diverse, which means they can, they can feed on all kinds of different foods. They can live in different environments. And they are adapted to most types of environments, from your refrigerator to hot springs in, in Yellowstone. 
And an example of this is archaea can live in the harshest conditions because they have unique membrane spanning lipids that help them survive in extreme heat, pH, and salinity. And salinity means salt. Prokaryotic cell structure. All right, so they come in different shapes. So bacillus is rod shaped bacteria, coccus is a spherical shaped bacteria, and they can form as pairs, chains, clusters of like grapes. Uh, they can form spirals, and some even have a flat appearance. So here's examples of the different prokaryotic or bacteria cell structure. More in detail here, you can see the ribosomes where it's a site of protein synthesis. They have a little tiny flagellum that helps them uh, move around in liquid. Uh, they have, they have uh, fimbrillae, which are hair-like bristles that them to attach to different structures. And they don't have a nucleus, but they have a nucleoid. And that's the location of the chromosome, plasma membranes, and a cell wall, and a capsule to protect them. All right, so we talked a little bit. There's a cell wall uh, consisting of a plasma membrane, a capsule, which is a sheath that surrounds the cell wall, and some bacteria helps from protect them from the environment. A flagellum of long thin appendage that uses for movement in some bacteria. Of uh, sperm also have a flagella. Okay, just an FYI. And they have these fimbrillae, which are short appendages that help attach the appropriate surface. So some bacteria, for example, that cause strep throat have these short appendages to help you stick to the back of your throat and cause infection. The nucleoid is a region of the cytoplasm where a single bacteria chromosome is located and it is not, not, not surrounded by a membrane. We, they also have ribosomes, which help make proteins. And some uh, prokaryotes have thycoloids. Uh, that contain light-sensitive pigments. And these are present in cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae. So we also have a cell envelope here that consists of the, the, the plasma of membrane, the cell wall, and the glycocalyx. And it's a phospholipid bilayer with bilayer, sorry, with embedded proteins in between. It forms a boundary that separates the contents of the cell from the surrounding environment. It also regulates the entrance and exit of substances within the cell cytoplasm, and the cell wall helps maintain the shape of the cell. The glycocalyx is a layer of polysaccharides or sugars that lay outside the cell wall in some bacteria. It aids against drying out and provides resistance against the host's immune system. And it, it's also very sticky, so it helps the bacteria attach to almost any surface. The layer is, is called a capsule when it's well organized and not easily washed off. So here's a diagram of the plasma membrane. You see the phospholipid bilayer and the proteins that are embedded in between. The proteins could be on the outside of the bilayer, the inside, or it can transverse the whole, the whole uh, phospholipid bilayer. Inside the cytoplasm, the semi-fluid medium of inside a cell is the cytoplasm. Some people also call it a, the cytosol. It's made of water, salts, and dissolved organic molecules such as lipids and proteins. And it contains thousands of ribosomes that, that synthesize proteins. The prokaryote DNA is located in the nucleoid, and many prokaryotes also have extra chromosome pieces of circular DNA called plasmids, and these are way smaller than the chromosomes. So on the surface of a prokaryotic cell, uh, there could be a flagella that helps it move around in medium or, or in liquid. Uh, we talked about this before. Some of have the short appendages, the fimbrillae that attach to surfaces. And prokaryotes can reproduce asexually by binary fission of using uh, a tubular structure called pili and to pass DNA from cell to cell. Eukaryotes, very different beast, structurally complex, have a nucleus, possess a multitude of membrane-bound organelles that have specific functions. 
And the eukaryotic cells make up the animals, plants, fungi, and protists. So many eukaryotic cells have cell walls, such as plants. And plant cells may have a primary and a secondary cell wall. Cellulose is the main constituent of primary cell walls in plants and is also found in algae, uh, a type of protist. And there is also another protein called lignin. Some people pronounce it lignin as well. It's found in the secondary cell walls. And the fungi cell walls are composed, composed of a protein called chitin. All right, here are the structures and organelles of eukaryotic cells. So we talked about the cell wall, the plasma membrane, and it has a defined nucleus, so there's a membrane around its DNA. All right, and inside the nucleus, there's a substructure called nucleoli, and this is areas where there's concentrated DNA of RNA and proteins. Of eukaryotic cells, like prokaryotic cells, also have ribosomes. So that's how our proteins are made. And another structural organelle is the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which helps in, in protein folding. More of organelles in eukaryotic cells. We have the Golgi apparatus. All right, so it packages and distributes proteins and lipids through the cell. We have lysosomes, which are in animal cells only, and they break down different components. Uh, vacuoles and vesicles just store ba storage bags for different substances. Uh, peroxisomes uh, break down fatty acids and do other met met uh, metabolic tasks. The good old mitochondria. So cellular respiration, that's where ATP is made, that generates all our energy. And uh, plant cells and some proteins have chloroplasts. That's where the chlorophyll is. Chlorophyll is. And that also generates ATP and, and sugar through a process called photosynthesis. Uh, we also have the cytoskeleton, which is the shape and movement of the cell. Uh, some have cilia and flagella, and this is also for movement of the cell. And in animal cells only has a, a organelle called the centrioles, and this is important for cell division to separate out the chromosomes during mitosis. So the term organelle originally referred to only uh, membrane-bound structures, but now it refers to any well-defined cell structure that performs a particular function in eukaryotic cells. So the cell is analogous to a factory or a city, I like to refer to, where raw materials come in and there's different parts of the city to run it or different parts of the factory to turn into various products, and it must also get rid of the waste of the cell. So here's the animal cell anatomy. Uh, it's a 3D picture here showing the plasma membrane, the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, the mitochondria there looks like a little kidney bean. Uh, you know, we have the Golgi apparatus, the centrosome, the centrioles. Uh, very, very busy, very, very complex. So to me, it looks like a very well-developed city versus a prokaryotic uh, cell is almost like a simple town in the country. Uh, very few of like no organelles, very simple structure, all in one shot. So here's an electron micrograph of an animal cell. It's pointing out the mitochondria, the nucleus, the chromatin, which is the, the DNA, uh, peroxisomes, and the endoplasmic reticulum. Plant cells are a little different. They have a large central storage vacuum that's filled with liquid and metabolites, and it helps maintain turgor pressure, which helps makes the plant stand upright. It has a nucleus, it has the ER, ribosomes, just like animal cells. The most specialized feature of the plant cell is, let's see, is right here the chloroplast, and this is where the chlorophyll is, and that's where photosynthesis occurs. So once again, another uh, electron micrograph of, of a, instead of an animal cell, this time a plant cell, and it shows you the mitochondria, the nucleus, the peroxisomes, ribosomes, this large central vacuole, the plasma membrane, the cell wall, and the chloroplasts. So 
So the nucleus is a prominent or, or easy to find structure, and it usually has a diameter of about five micrometers. And this is where it stores the genetic material, the DNA. And every cell in an individual contains the same DNA, and it tells the cell basically what to do and, and how it will perform. Uh, it also contains chromatin, which is DNA when it's wrapped around proteins. And when this condenses, this turns into chromosomes. So our chromosomes are both DNA and protein. So the fluid inside a nucleus is known as nucleoplasm. Uh, there is a substructure of the nucleus we briefly talked about before, the nucleolus, and that's where ribosomal RNA is made. There is a nuclear envelope, which is a double membrane that separates the, nu the nucleus from the cytoplasm. And there are nuclear pores in that envelope to allow proteins, ribosomal units, and RNA to go in and out of the nucleus. So here's, an, here's a picture of the nucleus here and shows you the pores, the envelope, all, all the details we talked about before. Ribosomes are an organelle and it's a site of protein synthesis. They use messenger RNA or what most people say mRNA as a template. It's composed of two subunits, a large and a small subunit. And the subunits consist of ribosome RNA and protein molecules. Uh, ribosomes are found in the cytoplasm and of, in groups they are known as polyribosomes and they're usually associated with a single mRNA molecule. And in eukaryotic cells, they're attached to endoplasmic reticulum. So the endomembrane system consists of the ER and the Golgi apparatus and several vesicles. And it acts as the transportation and product processing section of the cell. And it compartment, sorry, excuse me, it compartmentalizes the cell so that the enzymatic reactions are restricted to certain specific cell sections. So here's the ER here. The ribosomes are up here. This is where protein synthesis is, is, occurs. And then once the proteins are synthesized, it's to go through these little channels, these membranes, so they get put in the right parts of the cell. Right here is a smooth ER, no ribosomes on them. Here's a rough ER up here, where they have ribosomes attached to them. So once again, rough ER studded with ribosomes. All right, smooth ER, no attached ribosomes. It also synthesizes phospholipids or fats and has various other functions depending on the cell type. And this is where it forms uh, transport vesicles to move the proteins around in the cell. The Golgi apparatus is a stack of three to 20 slightly curved sacs. In animal cells, one side is directed towards the endoplasmic reticulum, the other side is directed towards the plasma membrane, and it's often referred to as a shipping center of the cell. So it collects, sorts, packages, modifies, and distributes materials such as proteins and lipids. So the Golgi apparatus again receives proteins and also lipid-filled vesicles that bud off from the, the endoplasmic reticulum. And proteins made in rough ER have tags that serve as zip codes to direct the Golgi apparatus where to send them. And the lipids and proteins are also modified in, transmit, in transit through the Golgi before being repackaged. And the contents are discharged out by a process called secretion. So here's a diagram how it works from where it comes down here from proteins being synthesized, going through the Golgi, going to the secretory vesicles, and then being secreted outside the cell. Uh, lysosomes are membrane enclosed vesicles formed by Golgi, and they create, contain hydrolytic digestive enzymes, so they break things down, and they can act as garbage disposals of the cell, and they break down unwanted foreign substances, such as viruses or bacteria, or worn out parts of the cell, and they can also bring macromolecules back into the cell. So vacuoles are just large membranous sacs. You can consider them like Ziploc baggies. 
Uh, they're larger than vesicles and they're more prominent in plants. And so the central vacuole in plants adds support and it stores water, sugars, pigments, and toxins. The peroxisomes are membrane bound vesicles containing enzymes. The actions of enzymes produce hydrogen peroxide and hydrogen peroxide is quickly broken down to water and oxygen by the enzyme catalase. And in liver cells, they metabolize fats and produce bile salts. And germinating plant cells, they oxidize fatty acids. So in each cell type, they have very specific functions. So there's a, a picture of a peroxisome here and a plant cell. So the energy related organelles are very, very important. So chloroplasts and, and mitochondria are organelles that specialize in converting energy into usable forms for cells. So the chloroplasts use solar energy to synthesize carbohydrates, and sometimes they can make ATP directly. And the mitochondria use the, the breakdown of carbohydrates to produce ATP. Only plants and certain proteins have chloroplasts. Uh, animals only have mitochondria, but plants have both chloroplasts and mitochondria. Okay, I'm back. I had to stop out for a little bit of lunch. So here's our next slide showing how solar energy uh, is picked up by the chloroplast, produces carbohydrate. Mitochondria then breaks down that carbohydrate, turns it into CO2 and water, and produces ATP, which is usable energy for the cells. So photosynthesis can occur in plants, algae, and cyanobacteria. And there's a couple of protozoans that also have chloroplasts. And solar energy is the ultimate source of energy for most cells. Cellular respiration allows all organisms via the mitochondria to convert energy into ATP. And ATP is used for all energy requiring processes in the cell. So in chloroplasts, the site of photosynthesis of uh, implants and algae has a unique structure. It's a double membrane, it has a stroma, which is a fluid filled space bounded by a double membrane. And it contains single circular DNA molecule and ribosomes. And the membrane system of sacs are called thycoloids. And you have the grain on the stacks of thycoloids and chlorophyll is located in these membranes. So here's a diagram of chloroplasts. We can see the double membranes, the thycoloid space, the thycoloids. And you can look at that in detail on your own. The mitochondria is found in almost all eukaryotic cells, including plants and algae. It's the site of cellular respiration. Once again, its structure is bounded by a double membrane. It has the matrix, the inner fluid filled space, and the Christi which formed by invaginations of the inner membrane to increase the surface area, and they also contain their own DNA. So here's a diagram of the mitochondria and shows the inner and outer membranes, the Christi and the matrix. So the cytoskeleton con consists of three interconnecting proteins, the actin filaments, the intermediate filaments, and the microtubules and it helps maintain the cell shape. And it also insists in movement of cells and organelles and is dynamic, which means it can be assembled and disassembled as needed. So the actin filaments are two long, thin, flexible chains twisted into a helix and they provide structure as a dense web under the plasma membrane for projections in intestinal cells such as microvilli and allow the formation of pseudopods and amoeboid movement. So actin interacts with motor molecules for movement. It's an example here is the myosin motor molecule in muscle cells. And so in the presence of ATP, myosin pulls actin along to help flex your muscles. So intermediate 
uh, filaments are intermediate in size between actin and microtubules, and they support the nuclear envelope to help form subtle cell junctions, such as those holding skin cells tightly together, and they help strengthen human hair. Microtubules are the smallest. They're hollow cylinders made of globular tubulin, alpha and beta, and they're also controlled by the microtubule organizing center, also known as MTOC. And the main function of MTOC in eukaryotic cells is to form the centrosome. So microtubules, once again, help maintain cell shape, interact with motor molecules, kinesin, and dynein to cause movement of organelles and form spindle apparatus during cell division. Centrioles, found in the centrosomes of animal cells and also may be involved in microtubule assembly and disassembly. And they are short cylinders with a nine plus zero pattern of microtubule triplets. Cilia and flagella, some of my favorites of hair-like project projections that aid in cell movement. And eukaryotes, cilia are much shorter than flagella. Both are membrane-bound cylinders and they form a nine plus two pattern of microtubules. So examples of cilia and flagella in nature, the paramecia, which is a protozoan, move around by means of cilia. The cell of the upper respiratory tract use cilia to sweep debris trapped within, within the mucus and sperm cells have flagella, which makes them mobile. So just the different diagrams of cilia and flagella here, you can study this on your own. So it shows you the, the sperm, you know, cilia in the lung, origin and evolution of the eukaryotic cell. So fossil records suggest first cells were prokaryotes, and then biochemical data suggests archaea and more closely related to euka eukaryotes. And eukaryotes evolved in stages from prokaryotes. So there is this endosymbiotic theory that mitochondria and chloroplasts were derived from prokaryotes that were taken up by larger cells. So mitochondria were originally heterotrophic bacteria and chloroplasts were originally cyanobacteria. And after living, uh, sorry, after entering the host cell, the bacteria began living together cooperatively. So here is a diagram of the evolution of the eukaryotic cell. And it originally was a prokaryotic cell and then it gains these, these little prokaryotic cells that turned into chloroplasts and mitochondria. All right, so the evolution, once again, you can study this on your own. And here's where the cell gains the mitochondria and chloroplasts and become more advanced and well-developed. So this is the supporting evidence for endosymbiosis. So both organelles are like bacteria in size and structure. Both organelles are bounded by a double membrane. And what's really important to me is both organelles have their own DNA, which is similar to that in prokaryotes. And their ribosomes also resemble those of prokaryotes. So the RNA or ribonucleic acid base sequence of the ribosomes and chloroplasts and mitochondria also suggests a prokaryotic origin. All right, that's it for this section. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, take care.